It is my absolute pleasure to announce that this video is sponsored by History Hit. This isn't just an award-winning podcast network or simply a history channel. This is a major platform where you have access to stories and historical journeys that have shaped the course of humanity. Imagine having Netflix, but it being all history. This is one of the leading networks in the world. There are hundreds of hours of historical documentaries that you can see on any device, anywhere, at your convenience. They're brought to you by expert historians like Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones, and many others. Aside from having expert-led programs in their library, they're consistently adding two more every week. Not to mention 19 new episodes weekly across eight podcasts, including Dan Snow's History Hit. That alone would make your commute, your workout, your road trip, etc. a historical voyage. Right now I'm enjoying a great new documentary on Hadrian's Wall. Imagine for a second what it would be like to live on the edge of the Roman Empire. You can now witness this incredible boundary firsthand. Right now there's a special offer for only YouTubers. Use the code HISTORYHIT and you'll save 60% for the first 6 months and have access to some of the best podcasts and video documentaries out there. So do yourself a favor, hit that link below, use the code, and sign up for History Hit today. Gaul comprises three areas inhabited respectively by the Belgae, the Aquitani, and a people who call themselves Celts, though we call them Gauls. The Gallic War, Book One, Julius Caesar. This episode of The Art of War is going to be about the Siege of Elysia. In September of the year 52 before the Common Era, Gaius Julius Caesar faced one of the most difficult challenges of his life. He was in foreign territory, and his worthy adversary Vercingetrix, the king of the Gauls from the tribe of the Averni, had given the Roman general a nearly unwinnable scenario. Vercingetrix had united many Gallic tribes under his banner and had brought Caesar's conquest of Gaul into a state of crisis. The Romans were now facing a united and determined enemy led by a skillful military commander. Indeed, earlier that year Vercingetrix had defeated Caesar's legions at the siege of Gergovia, forcing the Roman general to retreat. But in July of that year Caesar regrouped his men, brought in some German cavalry mercenaries, and at the Battle of Vingiani, it was Caesar's time to be victorious. Vercingetrix now retreated to Alesia. It was a fortified town built on a hill defended to the north and to the south by rivers. He had just about the same number of men as Caesar, but Vercingetrix held the high ground in an entrenched position. What's more, the Gallic king had significant reinforcements moving in. He wanted to trap Caesar in a pincer movement. For Julius Caesar, all of his options were poor. Attacking Alesia itself would likely have destroyed his army. Laying siege would have been playing into the enemy's hands as reinforcements were on their way. Caesar's legions would be vastly outnumbered. Retreating would have been equally undesirable. Caesar would have lost his gains, his reputation, his allies in Gaul would have abandoned him and he would have returned to a hostile Roman Republic to face the equivalent of political suicide. Most likely he would have been persecuted and even exiled. He would have become what he feared the most. A footnote in history. Gaius Julius Caesar was the type of man that would go right in. He opted to press the attack and lay siege. This is not what most military commanders, even the really good ones, likely would have done. On paper, this comes across almost like a suicide mission. The chances for success were very slim. And the person who points that out is Sun Tzu in The Art of War. He breaks down military encounters from the most advantageous to the least. Sun Tzu's number one principle is to win without fighting is best. And to paraphrase him, Therefore, those who win every battle are not really skillful. Those who render others' armies helpless without fighting are the best of all. The superior militarist strikes when schemes are being laid. 
The next best is to attack alliances. The next best is to attack the army. The lowest is to attack an enemy city. Siege of an enemy city is only done as a last resort. Julius Caesar rushed in and did exactly that. He was putting not just his reputation and his life on the line, but the lives of everyone who followed him. The outcome was never assured. Some can argue that what he did was reckless and foolish and decidedly self-centered. But, as he supposedly would later say, it's only hubris if I fail. Now the bigger question here is what would drive somebody to do this? To get part of the answer, you need to look at the political situation in Rome. It was a cutthroat, changing environment. When the last king of Rome was driven out, the Senate was established and was governed by two consuls that were elected into office for one year. That is all the time they had to seize greatness. That sense of need and wanting to accomplish something would have been ravenous, it would have been palpable. A truly ambitious man would have been driven to the verge of madness, knowing that time was running out. What's more, the late Roman Republic was a far cry from its origin on several major points. First, it had emerged from the Punic Wars against Carthage as the predominant power not just in Italy but in the western Mediterranean. The land around its borders were ripe for conquest. Second, prior to Caesar's campaign in Gaul, the Gracchi, that is two brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, from the patrician class, that is the upper class, had gone over the heads of the Senate and appealed to the plebeians, that is the lower class, to invoke land reform. This action was unprecedented, but it showed that the de facto power of the Senate could be broken by popular grassroots support. Now think about this for a second, because this is something that could be tapped into. It could be utilized, optimized, weaponized by a popular leader that had the agenda and the will to do it. Third, in 107 BCE, Gaius Marius, the uncle of Julius Caesar, radically reformed the Roman army. He standardized the legion, maniple, and cohort units. Now prior to this, a member of the armed forces had to be a landowner. This point was annulled. Thus, any citizen could join up with the prospect that if you fought for Rome, you could have land given to you at the end of your career. What's more, the responsibility of arming the men and supplying them fell into the hands of the leading general. While this created a more professional, standing army, it also had the effect of making the men more loyal to their general than to the Senate. It was into this situation that Julius Caesar found himself. He was surrounded by opportunity, and he was the type of man that was not going to let any of that go to waste. In 60 BCE, Caesar returned from his governorship in Hispania and demanded a triumph for his actions against the Iberian tribes. He was, after all, in a very favorable political situation to demand this triumph. He had a very strong alliance with two other very powerful men. This was an old boy's network on steroids. The first triumvirate, as it was later called, consisted of Gaius Julius Caesar, along with Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, who was an excellent general and statesman, along with Marcus Licinius Crassus, regarded as the richest man in Rome and fabulously immortalized in the Spartacus movie. Now, Caesar did not get his triumph, but he was made consul, and it's very likely that Pompey and Crassus had a hand to play in this. The very next year, in 59, he was made proconsul, that is, governor of Cisalpine Gaul and Illyricum for five years. Just as it so happened, the governor of Transalpine Gaul, Metallus Seller, died, and Caesar got that area as well. At this time in history, Caesar was heavily in debt, and he saw his governorship as an opportunity to line his pockets with money by military adventurism. Caesar, being the man that he was, even went so far as to write about his campaigns. His book, the Commentare de Bello Gallico, the Gallic Wars, is one of the few first-hand accounts of Gaul from this time. This book, however, is criticized heavily as being nothing more than propaganda, and you can see why. Enemy numbers are exaggerated, Roman casualties minimized, and my favorite, Caesar refers to himself in the third person pretty much the entire way through. Call it what you will, it made the man a living legend back in Rome. 
So with that, Caesar set off with his four veteran legions, the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, and his favorite, the 10th. The question was where was he going to go to, but opportunity would present itself. The Helvetii were a group of Gallic tribes that lived between the Rhone and the Rhine, roughly Switzerland. Many wanted to get out of that area as they were being harassed by Germanic tribes. They appealed to Caesar to enter Roman lands, but were declined. Caesar knew the fierce reputation of the Germans and wanted the Helvetii to remain in place to serve as a sort of buffer zone, if nothing else. But the Helvetii entered anyway, which gave the Roman commander a cause for war. To him, this was an invasion. In 58, the two forces met at the Battle of Bibracte. The discipline of the Roman army and its impressive engineering skills became readily evident. It was during this campaign that Caesar ordered his men to build a series of pontoon bridges which allowed him to maneuver quickly, find favorable ground, and in the initial fight he drove the Helvetii back. Book 1 brings us to life, quote, At length, exhausted by wounds, they, meaning the Helvetii, began to fall back towards a hill about a mile away. They had gained the hill, and our men were approaching to dislodge them, when 15,000 boyai, who protected the rear of their column, suddenly marched up, attacked us on the right flank, and surrounded us. Thereupon, the Helvetii, who had retreated to the hill, began to press forward again and renewed the battle. We changed front and advanced in two divisions, the first and second lines to oppose the Helvetii, whom we had already defeated and driven back, the third to withstand the newly arrived troops." End quote. Now, self-congratulatory propaganda aside, this does show an example of just how good Caesar and his men were. In the middle of a fight, they were able to change their tactics and win on two fronts. The Helvetii and their allies would be soundly defeated, sent back to their lands to grow crops, and would supply the Roman army. This, by the way, would be a hallmark of Caesar. He perseverated about maintaining his logistics. Later that year, another tribe attempted to cross into Gaul. This time it was the feared Germanic people who crossed the Rhine under their king, Ariovistus. The reputation for ferocity of these Germanic tribes sent panic through the legions. Book 1 mentions men tearful on, on the verge of nervous breakdowns which Caesar masterfully corrected. He knew he had to restore the morale of his men quickly. He pulled his men together, telling them that they had nothing to fear, that even the Helvetii had defeated the Germans, and, well, we've defeated the Helvetii. To prove his point, when the Germanic army approached, Caesar moved his camp closer to Ariovistus. On purpose, he put the 10th Legion as his vanguard. They were his favorite, the least inclined to show any signs of weakness, and when the rest of his men saw their bravery, they just all fell into line. Once again, conflict ensued, and once again, the Roman legions would be victorious. According to Caesar's account, most of the 120,000 men that had followed the Germanic king across the Rhine were slaughtered, or driven back across the river. They, at this point, would no longer pose a threat. Caesar's back-to-back -back victories sent a shockwave through the Gallic people, Tribes would now think twice about attacking the legions and would instead be more inclined to establish an alliance. As a result, Caesar could both raise new troops, secure his supply lines, and use the strategy of divide and conquer as he went. In 57, resupplied with fresh troops, Caesar advanced on the Belgae, another confederation of tribes in what would now be Belgium. Using forced marches to move quickly, the Roman legions surrounded the Gallic stronghold of Noviodunum. It was heavily reinforced and would prove difficult to attack directly, but Roman engineering would prove decisive. Quote, when the people of the city saw the mantles rushed up to the wall, earth shoveled into the moat, and siege towers erected, they were alarmed by the impressive size of the apparatus, which had never before been seen or heard of in Gaul and by the speed at which the Romans worked. They therefore sent envoys asking to be allowed to surrender, a request which Caesar granted." End quote. Without firing a shot, and by the skill of his engineers, Caesar had won again. Sun Tzu would have been proud, that is, if the story is to be entirely believed. 
However, despite his victories, opposition was growing. Shortly after his win at Novio Dunham, the legions were ambushed at the Battle of Sabus. The tribe of the Nervi, with their allies, managed to catch the Romans by surprise as they were setting up camp. Book 2 again brings us home. Quote, Caesar had everything to do at once, hoist the flag, recall the men from their work on the camp, fetch back those who had gone far afield in search of material, form the battle line, address the men, and sound the trumpet for signal for going into action. Much of this could not be done in such a short time. But the situation was saved by two things. First, the knowledge and experience of his soldiers, whose training in earlier battles enabled them to decide for themselves what needed doing. And second, the generals themselves did not wait for further orders, but on their own responsibility took the measures that they thought proper. End quote. The Battle of Sabus was an extremely brutal fight, but it was a great example that showed how Roman discipline and the ability to adapt turned a near defeat into victory. This capacity, by the way, is going to be paying dividends down the line. The Belge morale was shattered and many of the tribes sued for peace. Even German tribes sent envoys across the Rhine to do the same. Caesar became immensely wealthy and was able to pay off most of his debts. He had the momentum, he had the initiative, and he was going to use it. That winter, he had his men positioned in northern Gaul and then had the Gallic tribes feed them, a humiliating prospect at best. Back in Rome, a 15-day celebration was held in his honor. To the Roman people, he was becoming very popular. To the Senate, he was becoming very unpopular. Now think about the process that is evolving here for a second. You have a Roman aristocrat with a loyal army, the love of the people. Caesar is refining his abilities. He's encouraged by his successes. And his officers and men are becoming one of the finest armies in the world, not just in military tactics, but also in engineering abilities. Even defeat would be seen more as a setback than anything else. For example, he reported that campaigning in the Alps in the winter of 57, he reported that he was not entirely successful, but was still able to inflict major casualties. And so, with a mindset like that, his military endeavors would continue. In the year 56, in northwest Gaul, what we'd think of now as Brittany, the Romans took on the Veneti, a tribe that were expert sailors who made the mistake of imprisoning Roman envoys which was a big diplomatic faux pas. Both sides geared up for war, but Caesar quickly figured out that in order to beat the Veneti, he'd have to beat them at their own game. Thus, a fleet of ships were built. Granted, the Romans had oars and the Veneti had sails, but at the Gulf of Morbion, the two fleets collided. The Romans used a tactic that they had employed in the First Punic War, making a sea battle into a land battle, which, by the way, is laid out really nicely in Book 3. Quote, one device, however, that our men had prepared proved very useful. Pointed hooks fixed onto the ends of long poles, not unlike the grappling hooks used in sieges. With these, the halyards were grasped and pulled taut, and then snapped by rowing hard away. This, of course, brought the yards down, and since the Gallic ships depended wholly on their sails and rigging, when stripped of these, they were at once immobilized. After that, it was a soldier's battle in which the Romans easily proved superior. When the yards of the enemy ships were torn down in the manner described, two or three of ours would get alongside and the soldiers would make vigorous efforts to board it. When the natives saw what was happening and after the loss of several ships, they tried to escape by flight. They had already put their ships before the wind when suddenly there was a dead calm and they could not stir. Nothing could have been more fortunate for us. It enabled us to complete the victory." End quote. The Veneti were literally dead in the water. The Romans annihilated them. The elders were brought together, executed. Most of the rest were sold into slavery. That year, Caesar would continue to fight and take on a host of Gauls. For his own account, he massacred some, enslaved others, and befriended a few. Whereas some historians praise his military prowess, others felt he was conducting nothing less than genocide. Folks, curious what you think on this one. However, one thing was clear. As he continued his military operations, his reputation and his bank account grew by leaps and bounds. But like with any success, he would also have growing opposition. 
55 was a critical year. Back in Rome, the triumvirate was conducting some serious quid pro quo. With some very skillful political maneuvering, Caesar's governorship was extended another five years, and Crassus and Pompey Magnus were made consuls. Now, despite the fact that they were helping each other out, you gotta keep in mind that they were still contenders. Each of them were powerful, ambitious men with an agenda. Caesar knew he had to keep one step ahead. Once again, opportunity would present itself. When Germanic tribes attempted another crossing of the Rhine, Caesar answered in force, crushing them. His own description, however, sounded more barbaric than valorous. And indeed, at one point, the Senate would attempt to prosecute him as a war criminal. Book 4 gives some insight as to why. Quote, The soldiers formed in three parallel columns, ready for battle. They reached the enemy's camp quickly. Those of the Germans, who were quick enough in seizing their weapons, resisted for a time, fighting under the cover of their wagons and baggage. But there was also a great crowd of women and children in the camp, for they had brought all their families with them when they left home and crossed the Rhine. These began to flee in all directions and were hunted down by the cavalry which Caesar sent out for the purpose. Hearing cries behind them and seeing that their people were being massacred, the Germans threw down their arms, deserted their standards, and rushed out of camp. When they reached the confluence of the Moselle and the Rhine, they realized they could flee no further. A large number were killed and the rest plunged into the water and perished, overcome by the force of the current in their terror-stricken and exhausted state. End quote. It wasn't the massacre that people seem to remember, but rather what would come next, which some historians argue was nothing more than a publicity stunt. Now, throughout history, people are enshrined for being the first to fill in the blank, land on the moon, discover a continent, come up with general relativity. Caesar would be the first Roman to cross the Rhine and the English Channel, or at least be the first to write about it and take credit. From the Roman perspective, these bodies of water were the boundary of the known world. Everything on the other side was mystery and terra incognito. But it did make for good reading, not to mention the method in which he crossed. In his book, he would say, Caesar had determined to cross the Rhine, but a crossing by means of boat seemed to him both too risky and beneath his dignity as a Roman commander. So be it, he would build a bridge. Now, I'm not going to go into the exact minutia of how he did this, but suffice it to say, it's a good part of the book to read. It was an ingenious design. The current of the water itself would increase the structural integrity. Book 4 goes into what he did next. Quote, Ten days after the collection of the timber had begun, the work was completed and the army crossed over. Caesar marched into the territory of the Sugumbri, there he remained for a few days in their territory, burning all the villages and farm buildings and cutting down all the crops. He had achieved all the objectives for which he had come, and after spending a total of 18 days across the Rhine, he considered that he had done all that honor or interest required. End quote. Crossing the English Channel would come next. A small fleet of ships was constructed, the channel crossed, but Caesar landed with only a fraction of his force with a meager fleet, limited supply in unknown territory. From a military perspective, this was tactical folly, and eventually he was driven back. But from a PR standpoint, goodness, this was gold. He knew he had to return, which he did. He came back the next year in full force. A new and much more powerful fleet was constructed. He brought in five legions, 2,000 cavalry, and this time crossed the channel like a boss. Once on the other side, he set up a strong camp, eventually crossed the Thames, and brought Roman fury to the Britons. In doing so, he took captives, slaves, and forced them to give tribute. Thus, for him, it was mission accomplished. He was doing really well. But it was at this point that everything fell apart. 54 and 53 BCE would be some of the most difficult years of the Gallic campaign. It all started with a famine, described pretty well in Book 5. Quote, The harvest that year in Gaul was a poor one on account of drought. Caesar was compelled to change his previous method of quartering the army for the winter, and distributed the legions among a larger number of tribes. This wide distribution, Caesar thought, would be the easiest way of meeting the shortage. End quote. Now, from a practical perspective, this does make a lot of sense. 
But what it actually accomplished was to anger a lot of the tribes. And in a very short course of time, Caesar had a massive revolt on his hands. It nearly got out of control. One legion under the command of the Roman commander Sabinius was destroyed. Another legion was nearly wiped out. And now the Gauls were empowered to drive out the Republic. Caesar responded by bringing in more men, increasing his fighting strength to 50,000. He even brought in one of Pompey's legions. He then began a brutal campaign of suppression. In 53, he crossed the Rhine again, this time to punish the Germanic tribes for assisting the Gauls. In many cases, it went beyond simple conquest and retribution, entering into the realm of extermination. Caesar even went so far as to proclaim Gaul as a Roman province and thus subject to Roman law. This daunting fear and realization that they could be entirely wiped out and their culture eradicated moved the Gallic tribes to a new level of cooperation. This was mediated by the Druids, and ironically, it's Caesar's own words that give us one of the best insights on them. Quote, the Druids officiate at the worship of the gods, regulate public and private sacrifices, and give rulings on all religious questions. They are held in great honor by the people. They act as judges in practically all disputes, whether between tribes or between individuals. When any crime is committed or a murder takes place or a dispute arises about an inheritance or a boundary, it is they who adjudicate the matter and appoint the compensation to be paid and received by the parties concerned. Any individual or tribe failing to accept their award is banned from taking part in sacrifice, the heaviest punishment that can be inflicted upon a Gaul." End quote. The Gauls were ready to unite. They had the mechanism in which to do so. Eventually, it would be a charismatic and skilled leader of the tribe of the Averni that would bring them together. His name was Vercingetrix. Vercingetrix was a nobleman from the city of Gergovia who had a very capable mind for warfare. His father, Celtillus, attempted to unite the Gaul, but failed and paid the price with his life. And this should give you some example of just how desperate the Gallic tribes were. To come together required a significant external stressor. But whereas his father had failed, Vercingetrix would succeed. His revolt was a massive coalition of Gauls, brought together under the looming threat of a common enemy. Vercingetrix went right to work. He established a solid hierarchy of command, trained his forces to a level of discipline which bordered on the cruel, and employed tactics which showed that he definitely had skill at warfare. He never fought like a common barbarian. Vercingetrix would avoid pitched battles unless he had a significant advantage. Instead, he would use hit-and-run tactics, employed natural fortifications, and chose to only defend his most impregnable cities. It was a smart move. As Frederick the Great would later say in a distant age, he who defends everything defends nothing. But perhaps the most serious tactic that Vercingetrix adopted was a scorched earth policy. He made it a point to deny the Romans of shelter and forage, and would go out of his way to disrupt any type of supply line, which would send a chill down Caesar's spine. All of those advantages of exploiting the locals for food, having secure logistical supply lines, and using divide-and-conquer tactics that Caesar had enjoyed were now greatly diminished. It was now time for the Roman inhabitants of Gaul to feel the wrath of the Gallic nation. Caesar was still in Rome when he got word of Vercingetrix's rebellion and hastily left to organize his legions. His path made its way through Cis and then Trans-Alpine Gaul in a prolonged manner in order that he could recruit the most men along the way. At the same time, he brought his legions together. Caesar also made it a point to help out and defend his Gallic allies, at least the ones that remained. Vercingetrix was at this time laying siege to Gorgobina, the capital of the Boii, which he decided to disengage to face this new incoming threat. Caesar initially moved on to the town of Noviodunum, where he sent in his cavalry and drove off a contingent of Vercingetrix horsemen. The town itself was soon under Caesar's control, at which point he moved on to attack Avericum. It was in Avericum where Vercingetrix had maneuvered to and had marshaled his men. While he was organizing his Gallic forces, Vercingetrix addressed his generals in the city and laid it out for him. Quote, 
We must strive by every means to prevent the Romans from obtaining forage and supply. Along the enemy's line of march, we must burn all the villages and farms within the radius that their foragers can cover. The Romans will either succumb to starvation or have to expose themselves to serious risk by going far in search of food. We should also burn all the towns except those which are rendered impregnable by natural and artificial defenses. You may think that these measures are harsh and cruel, but you must admit that it would be a still harsher fate to have your wives and children carried off into slavery and be killed yourselves, which is what will inevitably befall you if you are conquered." End quote. It was during this meeting that it was also decided that Avericum would be defended rather than raised. Vercingetrix opted to lay his camp outside of the city in a strong position surrounded by a swamp. This allowed him to more freely deploy raiders. His plan was still to starve out the Romans by hitting their supply chains. Thus, Caesar moved right in and began his siege. Within 25 days, he had constructed walls, fortifications, and siege towers. Vercingetrix, of course, kept up the pressure by sending in one raiding party after the next. But Roman perseverance and luck would win out. Book 7 brings this to life. Quote, Caesar had completed the siege works which he had under construction and moved forward one of his towers. It began to rain heavily, and he thought this is a good opportunity to attempt an assault, especially as he saw that the guards on the wall had been carelessly posted. The legions got ready for action. Caesar called upon them to seize the chance of victory and reap at long last the fruit of all their toil. He promised rewards to those who would be the first to mount the wall. He then gave the signal for the assault." End quote. The Romans took the defenders of Avericum by surprise. They would stay up on the walls and use them to encircle the city. When the inhabitants saw this, they attempted to flee, but it was going to be a very bloody affair. It was reported by Caesar that of the 40,000 inhabitants of the city, only 800 managed to get out. Vercingetrix regrouped his men and moved on to Gergovia, his capital. After plundering Avericum for several days, Caesar followed in pursuit. Gergovia, however, was a very strong defensive position perched very high in a series of hills. The Romans set up siege like they did before, but the city was nearly impregnable, and this is where things went badly. Caesar planned to lure Vercingetrix off the high ground by sending in a contingent of his men as a decoy and then ordering them to retreat, hoping that the Gauls would follow. It's not entirely clear what happened, but it seems that orders must have been miscommunicated. Instead of retreating, the Romans charged the city defenses, which they were simply not prepared to do, and while they fought valiantly, the Gauls had the upper hand. And then, at a very critical time, Vercingetrix arrived at the front and led a crushing cavalry charge that demolished the Roman line. Vercingetrix that day would win, and Caesar was forced to pull back. Caesar then retreated east into friendly territory. He needed fresh supplies and decided to hire a very strong contingent of Germanic mercenaries, mostly cavalry, which would turn out to be a very decisive move. Vercingetrix, meanwhile, had pursued the Romans, hoping to build on his success at Gergovia. The two forces met at the Vingani River, where Vercingetrix attempted to stop the Romans from crossing back into his territory. But Caesar masterfully kept good formation, and his Germanic cavalry found an opening in the enemy line, exploited it, and routed Vercingetrix's forces. The legions inflicted heavy casualties, and now it was Vercingetrix's turn to withdraw to avoid being annihilated. The Gallic commander pulled his forces back to one of the most defensible cities in Gaul. He moved his men to Elysia. Alicia was a stronghold of the tribe of the Mandubai, which stood on top of a great hill and was flanked to the north and south by two rivers and their tributaries. A direct assault would have been suicide, so Caesar's only real option was to lay siege. This was just fine for Vercingetrix. He had already sent out orders and had massive Gallic reinforcements coming in. His plan was to trap the Romans. He was going to let them exhaust themselves in the siege, and when the rest of the Gauls showed up, they would smash the legions against the walls of his city. Vercingetrix knew that when all of his men had assembled, he would have the Romans outnumbered by as high as two to one. 
Caesar might have contemplated retreat at this point. After all, attacking a very strong enemy fortress in their territory while being outnumbered is perhaps not the best option. But to retreat would have also been a disaster. It would have led to political suicide back in Rome. The mighty triumvirate was no more. Crassus had led an invasion into Syria, where he and most of his army were killed by the Parthians at the Battle of Carrhae in 53. That balance of having three powerful men was done. Furthermore, when Caesar's daughter, who happened to be Pompey's wife, Julia, died, the bond that kept these two men from killing each other was now gone as well. All that was left was a rivalry that over the next couple of years would intensify, and as it would be said, a conflict was inevitable. Caesar was thus committed to beginning a massive siege of Elysia. He started by creating siege works that would encompass the city. This was an absolutely impressive feat of engineering. The siege works would span over 10 miles in circumference. And while the construction was going on, he made it a point to instruct his soldiers to go out and find enough food to support each man for 30 days. Vercingetrix would send out his cavalry forces to attack the Roman engineers and try to disrupt the construction. Initially, the Gauls did have some success with this, but eventually the Roman infantry was able to hold them at bay, and the Germanic cavalry would race in and drive them off. In response, a series of trenches, moats, and earthworks were created to slow down surprise attacks. Towers were then built every 130 meters. They were fortified to the point where they could be easily defended by even a small force. It was during this time that Caesar learned of the massive Gallic reinforcements that were coming in. He eloquently described his solution. Quote, when these defenses, meaning the inner circle, were completed, Caesar constructed a similar line of fortifications facing outward instead of inwards. This line described a circuit of 14 miles running along the flattest ground that could be found, and its purpose was to hold off attacks from outside, so that even if Vercingetrix's cavalry assembled a very large force, the troops defending the siege works could not be surrounded. End quote. Between the two walls, infantry and cavalry camps were established. Caesar then deployed his men with very specific instructions on which area to defend, and appointed his best commanders to better maneuver men to areas that would come under threat. Thus, when crisis came, it would be like general quarters on a ship. Everyone knew what to do. Now it was time to sit back and simply starve out the inhabitants of Elysia, where the food supply was running out fast. Vercingetrix convened a council of war where it was decided to arm anybody that could fight. However, the weak, the old, the infirmed, the young were simply driven out of the city to fend for themselves. These poor masses made their way to the Roman walls, where Caesar too refused them entry. Many would succumb to starvation. Their bodies would litter the no man's land between the two armies. In time, the Gallic reinforcements finally arrived. For Caesar, there were a quarter million of them, though a more realistic number would probably be in the 75 to 90,000 range, still an impressive number. These incoming men were led by Vercassa Valenus, the Avernian, a cousin of Vercingetrix. The Romans were now greatly outnumbered, again by some estimates as high as two to one. Soon after arriving, the Gauls began a reconnaissance in force, probing the outer wall for weaknesses and filling in some of the moats. Caesar responded to this by sending out his men backed up by the German horsemen. A major fight ensued. Vercingetrix, seeing this from his commanding position in Elysia, sent out his men from the city to attack the inner Roman wall. From the Roman perspective, it was said, quote, As the action was taking place in full view of everyone so that no gallant exploit and no act of cowardice could pass unnoticed, the thirst for glory and the fear of disgrace was an incentive to both sides. They had fought from midday to near sunset, and the issue was still in doubt. When the German horse massed all their squadrons at one point, charged the Gauls, and hurled them back. When their cavalry broke and fled, the archers were surrounded and killed. The rest of our horsemen advanced from other points, pursued the fugitives right up to their camp, and gave them no chance of rallying. At this, the Gauls who had come out of the town went back in, bitterly disappointed and now almost despairing of success." End quote. 
The Gauls would retire for a single day, using the time to create siege ladders and grappling hooks. They were planning a combined attack on both the inner and the outer walls. At midnight, they launched this concerted attack and achieved complete surprise. Initially, the Romans were stunned. At the main focus of the attack, they fell back. But as Caesar's luck would have it, this portion of the wall was held by a very skillful commander by the name of Mark Antony. Mark Antony brought in men from wherever he could to strengthen the line and fill in gaps in the defense, stripping other areas almost entirely. Vercingetrix, meanwhile, had ordered his men to attack the inner wall again, but he was delayed by the Roman trenches and earthworks, which needed to be neutralized. This gave the legions valuable time. After intense fighting on the outer wall, Mark Antony managed to push the Gallic reinforcements back. When Vercingetrix saw his countrymen being driven off, he retreated back to Alesia again. At this second failure to break the siege, another council of war was conducted, where Vercingetrix was determined to use his strength and numbers to full effect. Instead of attacking just a portion of the Roman inner and outer line, it was decided that simultaneous attacks at multiple points would be conducted. Vercassa Valenus was ordered to recon the outer wall in greater detail. To the north-northwest of the city, he found a tall mountain whose slope went down to the Roman outer wall. It was an advantageous position as he'd be holding the high ground, a perfect place to launch an attack. Vercassa Valenus then had his Gallic army nearly surround the Roman outer wall, but he concentrated a large force on that mountain where he decided the main thrust of the attack would occur. At noon, the attack came. Vercassa Valenus sent his huge contingent down the slope as both the inner and the outer wall were attacked on several fronts. The scene was terrifying. Quote, there was fighting simultaneously all over the field, and the Gauls tried every expedient, concentrating on the weakest point of the defenses. Distributed as they were along the lines in such length, the Romans found it difficult to meet simultaneous attacks in many different places. They were unnerved, too, by the shouts that they could hear behind them as they fought, which indicated that their lives were not in their own hands, but depended on the bravery of others. It is always the invisible dangers that are the most terrifying. Caesar found a good observation point where he could follow the action and send help where it was needed. Both sides realized that this was the time above all others for supreme effort. The Gauls knew that unless they could break through the lines, they were lost. The Romans, if they could hold their ground, looked forward to the end of all their hardships. The danger was greatest at the fortifications on the hill where Vercassivalanus had been sent. The unfavorable downslope of the ground told heavily against the Romans. Some of the Gauls flung javelins, while others advanced to the attack with shields locked together above their heads. Fresh troops continually arrived, relieving them when they were tired. All of them threw earth on the fortifications, which enabled them to climb the ramparts and cover the obstacles hidden in the ground. End quote. The Romans were extremely spread out, and the Gauls were about to create a massive breach. The legions were getting to their breaking point. Caesar knew his men would not be able to hold the lines forever. He took his last spare cavalry, along with the Germanic mercenaries, and managed to ride past his outer wall and behind enemy lines. He made it to the hill where Vercassivalanus had assembled his men. Caesar then rode nearly to the summit, and once behind the enemy, he ordered a devastating charge that came down the hill and right into the rear of the enemy line. The Gauls were taken by complete surprise and were simply slaughtered. Vercassa Valenus was even taken prisoner, and it was said that only a handful of his men managed to escape the carnage. Upon seeing the destruction of the main part of their army and their commander taken prisoner, the morale of the Gallic reinforcing army was shattered. They withdrew, leaving Vercingetrix and Alicia in the distance as they rode off. When the dawning realization of what had just happened reached the defenders of Alicia, the Gauls fighting along the inner wall gave up and retreated to the city. They knew that their defeat was now assured. Book 7 brings us home. Quote, the next day, Vercingetrix addressed an assembly. I did not undertake the war for private ends, but in the cause of national liberty. And since I must now accept my fate, I place myself at your disposal. 
make amends to the Romans by killing me or surrendering me alive as you think best. A deputation was sent to refer the matter to Caesar, who ordered their arms to be handed over, and the tribal chiefs brought out to him. He seated himself at the fortification in front of his camp, and there the chiefs were brought out. Vercingetrix was delivered up, and their arms were laid down. End quote. Caesar had accomplished an incredible feat, albeit the Roman commander came close to being utterly wiped out on several occasions. The rest of the war in Gaul would last until 50 BCE, but it was more of a mop-up operation. The backbone of the Gallic nation had been broken. Gaius Julius Caesar was now a fabulously wealthy individual with a loyal army at his back. His reputation had grown considerably, and most of the people of Rome were in awe of his exploits. It should be mentioned, however, that his great victories were not entirely his own. Caesar had incredible commanders with him, men like the aforementioned Mark Antony and others like Titus Labienus, who were military masterminds themselves. Some of these men had been with Caesar since the beginning of his campaigns. Sadly, there's just not enough time to really get into them, but I definitely recommend you look them up. Now, in time, Gaul would become a Roman province, but Caesar would have very little time to enjoy his success. His growing prestige, wealth, army, and influence over the people of Rome had made him enemies in the government. A growing list of senators saw him as nothing more than a threat that needed to be neutralized. After all, an aristocrat with these type of assets could march on Rome and then declare himself the next king or emperor or perhaps dictator for life. Take your pick. The very next year after his conquest of Gaul had ended, Caesar was compelled to cross the Rubicon in 49, and in doing so he began an extensive civil war. Some commanders like Mark Antony would follow him, others like Titus Labienus would not. To the former, I would commend his sense of adventure, and to the latter, I would commend his sense of devotion. Either way, by crossing the Rubicon, Caesar had set a path that would decide the fate of the Roman Republic. It was another long shot, but as he was fond of saying, it was only hubris if I failed. <laughs>